We run our band like a little club, you know, it's like a little boys club. There's only three members and there, there are no more passes to the club. I like to sort of think of myself more as an emissary of the muses, J.D. <laughs> Where I'm taking a Canadian point of view and a Canadian message to the rest of the world. I, I feel like I'm in the, you know, one one tenth of one percent of the population that's doing something that they love. In terms of um, the overall theater of the event, it has to be a step forward. Put this one in front of the stage, on stage left, right on the floor. The ghosts of Woodstock still haunt the next of kin. But the screams and shouts have turned to whispers on the wind. The time has come to face the news to come Okay. How you doing, Dad? Mom's still with you or she gets smart? Alright, hey, we're ready you are. We've got five semis worth of equipment. It's about 173,000 pounds of gear. We consume enough electricity to supply the hydro to about 45 suburban homes. I've got a road crew of 33 maniacs out here. We carry enough pyrotechnics to blow up the building we're standing in. We move it from city to city. I guess the thing that really amazes me the most is that we can set this thing up, take it down, move it four or 500 miles away to the next city, and do it all again the next day. That still amazes me, and I've been in this business 13 years. I get cast in the role of uh, being in charge of the production because I was originally a roadie before I was a musician. When I was uh, in high school in about grade 10, there was a local band and I started out being a roadie. And uh, so when Triumph started, I was the only one with roadie experience. <laughs> so yeah, in the, in the, in the bars, uh, you know, we were always trying to do uh, whatever we could do to, you know, look better than the next band that was coming down uh, the pike and uh, just continued over into the... Uh, arena circuit. This is our 20th week, a little over 100 times so far, and uh, it takes us about seven hours to bring it in. He's uh, a total of 34 people to do it, right up on stage. Five riggers, eight loaders, 20 stage in, a couple of forklifts. It's one of the largest out in the road right now. Definitely the largest laser show. We have two lasers, a 171 Spectra Argon, putting out 20 watts blues and greens, and a coherent K100 Krypton, putting out about six watts of red. What's this, uh, this apparatus here that the lasers are set in? This is a, basically just an optical table, and we have actuators to intercept the beam path as the beam's traveling along, to direct it to different effects. When the lasers are up to full power, the argon has been known to go through two by fours. It's powerful enough to, to damage you if you're close enough to it. It will burn through. I don't know if you can catch it lighting the cigarette there. Lasers to me are just um, 
they're just part of the lighting system. Like I, I don't even think about designing a Triumph show without having lasers. How far do you plan on taking it? Holograms and you know, projecting yourselves into the audience? There is no limit. There's no limit, JD. I mean, you just, you know. comes in two parts. There's a fuel and an oxidizer. And it's safe until you mix the two together. We use these electronic uh, matches or gerbs or, or pardon me, squibs. Um, it's just basically like a match with a little piece of wire wrapped around it. Then we use uh, fountains like you buy in your everyday variety. Uh, the Fourth of July type fountains which give you a sparkle effect or Roman candles. And we have some uh, very fast fountains which are called gerbs or direct short circuiters, which can be effective, just a, a flash. How dangerous is this stuff? Well, in the hands of somebody who's not experienced, it can be very dangerous. Um, because it's magnesium, which burns at a very high temperature, uh, burns can be very severe. Um, as far as during the show, we take a, a lot of precautions. Fire extinguishers everywhere. Um, we have a lot of people watching. Before we fire, we make sure nobody's going to be in the way. Ever have accidents? No, no, not too often. <laughs> Hopefully we'll never have accidents. Two, three, fire. One, two, three, fire. One, two, three, fire. One, two, three, fire. Right from day one, people were coming, coming to see us and became fans based on word of mouth about our live shows, more so than, you know, us. You know, we never had the classic hit record that went to the, you know, to the top ten, and as a result, you know, we gained a lot of popularity. Ours was very slow, and it was based on live concerts, so without doing this, never would have happened. One of the most interesting things that we do is keying, having the drums key off recorded drum sounds. And I'm just as a demonstration, I'm going to use this microphone. Let's say this microphone was on the snare drum. Just by hitting it, it makes a snare drum sound. But down here, we can adjust to different sounds. We'll go to kit number two. We have a completely different sound. Hey, 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 hey. Get me with the laser here. <laughs> That's how it's done. Guys, go and have a beer, and they sent me on your own on my lonesome. And they said, Rick, you get up there and entertain those people. You're the last one.
on in. Welcome to my little uh, office, crypt as it were. Um, I guess all musicians probably have some place where they go to write and be creative and stuff. And this is where I come. This is my little um, basement recording studio office um, hidey hole, as it were. And I come here to um, work on tunes and practice and write and um, uh, fiddle about, basically. So here we are in the Hall of Fame as we go on the house tour. And uh, this is the uh, Firemus Ackerman guitar that I used. Triumph fans will probably recognize this. The first three or four tours that Triumph did, I was using these guitars. This one has uh, really seen the uh, really seen the road in a lot of different ways. You can see it's pretty well backed up, and here we have the official Triumph trademark. Uh, it's got the singe up here. That's from the early days when we used to use uh, sparklers on the guitars, which is something we probably shouldn't go into because it's just too scary. Let's see. Let's move along here. <clears throat> this is my George Benson guitar. This was the first good guitar that I ever really owned, a Guild X500, and. Uh, I used to play that in the early days in bar bands and stuff, and people would say, why is that guy playing rock on a jazz guitar? He's a weirdo. And they were right. My influences on this instrument are really diverse. I mean, in the early days, it was literally that, that kind of really... You know, that stuff, and, and uh, I eventually uh, got to the point where I was playing a little bit of, of Bach studies and things. At the same time, I was sort of into a lot of jazz guitarists, so, you know, these kinds of things. But when Triumph started, we used to play, uh, let's see, uh, A lot of deep purple, so all of that stuff like a... I think that uh, of all the riff rocker guitar players, Jimmy Page is probably the top uh, guy in that field. And, and try in the early days, we sort of were a Zeppelin copy band in the bars and stuff. I mean, I actually still use that riff live in the in the in the arena. It's great. You, know, you hear it coming off the back wall. Bum, bum, bum. I think that's why I wrote the riff, actually. So. these very difficult times you know as we kind of uh, as we scoot out of the 80s and into the 90s I think it's I think it's kind of a reason for being rock and roll I think so I think so yeah a reason to get up every morning absolutely a reason life's to go to bed every night life's too short yeah you've got to get up and you've got to go to bed you just got to do it Triumph are always a great band. They always deliver. Always do what they have to do. It's just play their great music.
beat every time they play. It's just, that's great. That's the best part about it. Wonderful group. Most of their songs are about hope. They aren't about nonsense. They are not the uh, the uh, typical quote heavy metal band. They are far beyond that barrier. That's what makes them different and, and, and more exclusive from the other heavy metal bands that play here. A wonderful group. Number one. Uh, do you agree with what he's saying? Yeah, he's my cousin. I think rock fans are, are rock fans regardless of where they are and uh, the, the music that we play appeals to a certain number of people in, uh, you know, in, in every city, I guess. And even though we sort of spread out of, out of Texas, uh, it, it's really developed to a point now where we feel at home no matter where we are in North America. Oh, that looks so nice! Is everybody having a good time? Cause that's what it's all about, having a good time! All we can do for you now is give you our very best! Are you ready? I say, are you ready? We've been uh, subjected to the, the controversy about demon rock and, and uh, backward masking and all that stuff more from being in the United States than, than uh, is really apparent in, in Canada. It really is a big issue down here. And uh, the funny thing is, is we've been getting, uh, the, the publicity we get about it is, is reverse publicity. And in, in other words, they, a lot of writers and, and uh, people in the media have seen you know, the positive aspects to some of the lyrics that, that uh, we've written over the years. And uh, so they sort of placed us as the flip side of the coin to that whole devil worship thing. And uh, that was unintentional on our part. But uh, I guess that's just a product of who we are and the songs we write and what we have to say. I've always wondered what would be like Just you and me, baby, nothing else we meet again, both of us by circumstance Stay with me, we might never get this chance to hold on to love Just one night Don't try to fight about it, take me, I'm yours Just one night I never start with a concept of, I'm gonna write a song about a guy and a girl, or I'm gonna write a song about a marina, or I'm gonna write a song about, you know what I mean? I, I start with, uh, with a lick, with a, with a sound, with a rhythm, and then I develop it, and I try and see what I can sing that feels right with that riff, and depending on the, 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 the mood or the texture of what is being developed, that usually shapes the lyrics. I write a little bit differently than that. When I write, I tend to, I start out with the germs of ideas, and it'll be uh, anything, a rhyming couplet or um, uh, a musical idea, and I just keep reams and reams of notes. So you can see, this is from the Sport of Kings tour. This was the pad that I had out on the road with me, and it's just different things, stories and, and lyric lines and musical ideas. I also take this around with me wherever I go, and I'll show you an example of what this sounds like. <laughs> Pretty scary. This is the David Foster technique. That's why I fell. <laughs> right, so there you go. Um, then I come down here and I start to convert these things into little ugly, disgusting charts, and uh, I'll create little uh, chord structures and progressions and things. And then I'll take the song and try and get it into some sort of a demo form. And I put it on a four track with a little drum machine and uh, throw some bass guitar on it and stuff. And then I play it for the other guys. And usually they, at that point they'll say, no, this is no good, Rick. <laughs> so then I go back to the drawing board and start again. <laughs> The 
essence of rock and roll really is, is the live exchange between the audience and, uh, and, and the entertainer. We became successful not based on having a hit single, uh, we became successful based on having uh, you know, a loyal following of fans that, that really were into what we were into live and that real you know, electric uh, response between the two of us in, in whatever the venue, whether it was a bar or now when it's in arenas. So uh, that's the essence for us, I think. It's beautiful. Yeah, that's right, man. What is? It's hey, hot. It's warm. I tell you what, water. it's like. It's like we've got live fans oh, out here. Oh, the, it's the beautiful. State, the awesome. They're the best shows bands. The, the baddest, rock and roll man. heavy metal yeah, is the best. I got beer, I got weed, I got wine, I got cigarettes. Tell me what you want, tell me what you don't. Hey man, you pour it down, bro, you know? It's here, right? Why not do it, man? Straight up. Straight up. Wow, the women are good looking. Woo! Beer's roll. cold, ground soft, and free cigarettes. Okay, that's all. Did you get enough? Something you'll never forget as long as you live if you were there because the mass of humanity was so, uh, was, when they coined the phrase awesome, well, that's what they were talking about because when you looked out, it was a, a sea of humanity. I think for me, as far as live performances are concerned, that was probably uh, the most exciting time we were on stage. Boy, going on in front of 350,000 people was, uh, that's not going to happen again, I don't think. The way the famine uh, offsets on the bays, you know, it's just like uh, my interior designer would love it. Heather Lockner, she was backstage last night, honey, it's all over, see ya. Wait, look, pan up here. Oh, see, I'm playing it safe.
I think I'm doing this for the good of my health. <laughs> this is how you get on a plane. Free dinner, though. Number seven, as opposed to the old number six, you know. Uh, let's make this in Tennessee. It's Tennessee whiskey. That's why they're so weird down there. Hey, Gil. Hello there. We're on final approach, Oakland Airport, runway two seven. We're about a five mile final. Touching down here in about a minute and a half. The red carpet. Nice. Oh, you are. Watch the red carpet. Every time I get out of a Learjet, I bump my head. I've done it once. Don't do this to me, okay? Like I'm tired and cranky, you know? You don't want all M and M's with all the brown ones removed, right? Ah, uh, we used to do that, but we, you know, we don't do that. We decided it was tacky. That's it's some other guy. They, they, they stole the idea from us, so you know, we decided that let let them do it instead. Observe the catering. It's a beautiful thing. Here we have napkins, plates, forks, and stale sandwiches. What, what the heck? There's there's certain physical pressures that are on your body, and uh, you know. A lot of bands make the mistake of messing up, messing themselves up, and then all of a sudden they cancel shows because they can't sing, you know, or the, the show's bad because they stayed up all night and, uh, you know, didn't get enough rest before they went on stage. For us, it's always been the bottom line. The audience paid paid for their ticket. They deserve the best, uh, the best that we can do. Yeah. All right. Hello. It's time for the show of shows. California's only true rock and roll FM and Triumph going back to their progressions of power LP and I live for the weekend. Rick! Yes! God, you guys are good! <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Getting back to the tour now. You've been out on the road since September. What can you tell us about the production? Sometimes I, I ask myself <laughs> how can I maintain this? And the answer is that I don't think that I can <laughs> at this point. But I'm at the end of a tour so I'm burned out and I'm crispy around the edges, you know. Um, as I get older and other things become more important to me, the, the specter of huge tours that last really long periods of time, they just bite too big, ch too big a chunk out of my life. And uh, I need time to be able to do some of the other things that I want to do. I feel like I'm in the, the you know, one one-tenth of one percent of the population that's doing something that they love. In the music business, you see so many people that get so pumped up with the, uh, the you know, the industry adrenaline. And uh, it, it, I think it's a destructive thing eventually, and I think you have to realize that you, you constantly have to stand back from what you're doing and, you know, evaluate it for what it is. It's, it's, a, it's a career, it's a, it's a job, it's hopefully something that you love, but uh, it's not something that you want to be the overriding part of your personality or uh, become too important in life. Thanks to JD and everybody else. Terrific.
Thank you. Bye. See you. See you. Scott's Photon on Long Island, New York. Say bye. Adios, amigos. Sí, como no, te veras. Hey, goodbye. Have a good day. We love you. We mean it. Don't change. Goodbye. See ya. And have a pleasant tomorrow. Good. See you later. Okay. One more time. Bye. bye. See ya. Goodbye, eh? Say bye, Dan. Bye. See you next year. The nation's music station. Okay. In stereo. Much music. Bye. I'm supposed to say bye. Bye. Sell. Bye. It's been fun having everybody out here. You know, it's like it's not every every day of the week. Mitch, I'm telling you, like, you gotta get Mitch in here All right. on, on, on camera. Mitch is my main man here, and, and you know, you guys have made it. You know, a lot of fun. JD, much music, everybody, and Mitch especially. Oh. It's just been a, it's been a beautiful say goodbye. thing. Okay, say goodbye. Goodbye. We love you. Triumph loves you. <laughs> You didn't say it tonight, though, boss. I did too. <laughs> you did not. I did, did too. You did? I did. I was oh. gonna bet him money. You shouldn't have backed me up yet. So I would. Come on. I'm out of here. Come on. See ya. Do I throw my glasses? Put a face. Good night.